welcome you to the first Mayor's Summit on repurposing the AS power plant site in Redondo Beach as well as the Edison Power Line Corridor. This is a big deal. Tonight's kind of the beginning of, of a education process and, and explaining what's at stake and, and how we can you know, best look at it and, and move forward because it's going to require a public vote and the more educated the residents are, the better choices they're going to make. Uh, so the plant is coming down. It's due to retire. <laughs> and the power lines are eventually going to come down. <laughs> that was supposed to be all together, but uh, I guess they're each worth their own applause. So it's been a long, uh, uncertain, difficult uh, road. And uh, as many of you I see out there know, I've been working on this for probably 17 years. This is all isn't going to happen soon, but it is going to happen. So um, welcome, as I said, to the first summit. Here's our uh, favorite power plant. There's been a series of these uh, at this site for over 100 years. And if you look closely at it, you see there's actually three power plants here. The one on the left was built in the 40s. The one in the center was built in the 50s. And the one all the way to the right was built in the 60s. So um, we don't only have one power plant to demolish and remediate, we have three. And the plant is, this particular plant is permanently retiring at the end of 2020. It's 50 acres in size, and there's going to be, obviously, with the uh, repurposing of this, a major, major transformation in Redondo Beach and really the entire South Bay. The site's only zoned for industrial uses, conditionally, or a park. So uh, AES has had the site for sale for two years for non-industrial uses. Uh, back in 2008, we passed a measure DD, which amended our city charter, which now requires a public vote for any major change in allowable land use, a technical phrase. <clears throat> so what goes here, what rezoning goes here will not be made by uh, some elected officials in the middle of the night on a narrow vote, the voters are going to be deciding in an election at the polls. And that's, <clears throat> that's what's really, really unique uh, about this site. Because most areas, uh, it does not require a public vote. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of moving and grooving and shaking and jiving behind the scenes to, to get something done with you know, a much more smaller body. So. Um, what initiated this event it was a recent trip I took to Alaska, of all places. And I got an email one day and said, hey, come to Alaska, be part of this uh, uh, Mayor's Institute on Community Design. It's sponsored by the National Endowment of the Arts. And uh, they do these, I think, two or three times a year. And they invited six mayors from around the country and uh, a variety of experts from around the country to sit for two days in a room, show the projects that you have, and get the feedback from experts in other parts of the country. So uh, it was a great opportunity, and I jumped on it. And I felt very uh, honored, because they had looked at hundreds of cities around the country, and Redonda, little old Redonda Beach was one of the cities they selected. And when you see the opportunity we have, which you guys all know, it's understandable why they did that. So. Um, at, at, at the end of it, I'd gotten so much great feedback, and, and I, I wanted to share it with everybody, but you know, I'm not an expert, and I really, really wanted somehow to impart everything that I'd learned and the insights that I'd gained onto the community. And one of the gentlemen I met was uh, Richard Wilson, who I'm going to introduce more formally later, and uh, he helped with Millennium Park, and he was just so excited about the whole thing, and was asking me a bunch of questions and telling me this, telling me that, and I go, wow, Richard, if you're ever in L.A., would you come and and you know, meet with the community and just kind of give your insights. And, and he said, oh, I'll do better than that. We'll just schedule a, a definite time, and I'll come out here on my own dime, and, feel, and I'll be happy to uh, meet with the community and, and tell, share my experiences and, and answer their questions and show them what I think of this. So it was really Richard's uh, gracious offer that got me going and said, OK, well, then we're going to do this. And so um, yeah, big round for Richard. <laughs> So 
So one of the most important aspects I've learned about this opportunity and in talking to the others and up at the event in Alaska was that the city needs to lead this process, right? Instead of just sitting around in kind of a passive way and waiting for a developer to come with a big plan or whatever ends up happening, we really need to get out front on this and, and give an idea of what we're looking for, how we would you know, view it, how it would you know, unfold, and, and how would we get the money and all that sort of thing. So I decided to take a much more proactive approach instead of just sitting back and, and being, less, being more passive. So tonight and future events like this will be about educating the public up front about how these public venues get built when opportunities present themselves instead of just waiting around, as I described. So tonight, it's not just about listening to me. It's about proposing designs, listening to the experts, and you formulating your own ideas about how this can happen and what's at stake here. I didn't really go through my slides, I apologize. <laughs> but this were some of the cities that were in the um, Mayor's Institute on Com Community Design that showed up in Alaska. Here's a group of people. There were mayors from Idaho Falls, uh, places in Colorado, uh, a lady from Union City. It was really, really a good group of people. So I have a video I'm going to show. Most of you have seen the video. It's a great aerial video uh, that shows basically what we have before us, describes a little bit about the history. Most of you have probably seen it, but I know some of you haven't. But it does a good job of framing up what, uh, uh, what we have before us. So let me start that. Well, we don't have any sound. Not sure what happened. Technical difficulties. Is there something on here? I doubt it. It was working. Yeah. Let's try this again. Give them a minute. I think they're working on it. ideas? Yeah, it's fine. Let me try it again. Well, I guess we're not going to have sound, so I'll just walk you through it. How about that? <laughs> um, so you're going to see in a second the actual power plant. There it is. It's 50 acres. There's a harbor in the background. There were 19 of these power plants on the coast of California. All of them are retiring or being uh, repurposed. This particular plant here is going to retire permanently, along with plants like Morro Bay, Chula Vista, uh, and a couple others. So there's a harbor in the background. There's looking east. That's the AS power, or I'm sorry, the Edison power line corridor to the left. And everybody's familiar with the Weiland Wall there to the right. There's the old Salt Lake. That's taken from 1908. Uh, that's what used to be here, a giant Salt Lake. It's a state landmark, and the community's looking to actually restore a piece of that wetland and, and you know, create a habitat and wildlife and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of money out there for that, and the state and other agencies are quite excited. There's the old Redondo Beach red car. You used to be able to take that from downtown in 30 minutes. How about that? <laughs> Try that, 2018. About an hour and a half, two. Hey, there are the old tall ships, right? This used to be the port of LA, and they'd come in, drop their lumber off right on the rail lines that went out to the pier. You know, Redondo Beach ha has a really, really rich history. A lot of people don't realize that San Pedro went out for LA Harbor. There's looking east, that's Dominguez Park. Then you turn around west, this is our drone video. You see the power line site, it's nurseries mostly underneath it. That's Hermosa Beach off in the distance, as you know. 109 yet. There's actually two sets of para power lines there, uh, large 220 kV lines, which are definitely uh, can be removed. There's uh, on the right there, you see the smaller 66 kV lines, which uh, I know can be removed or I've been told from prospect of the power plant, but they may have to be stay, may have to stay or be buried, the smaller lines uh, to the right. 
There's our power plant, power line cluster that we've had for however long. That's the 232 bus, um, Metro 232 bus that drives down PCH. That's Highway 1, get about 80,000 cars a day there. That's looking east from the power plant. That's the uh, post office building there. You guys are all familiar with that. There's, uh, there's six acres of active wetland that the Coast Commission has determined uh, are active wetlands looking to restore. There's a shot of our harbor again, 1,400 slip boat harbor. There's an entrance to our harbor. Looking south, of course, at the Palos Verdes Peninsula, coming up on the Seaside Lagoon. People love the Seaside Lagoon. I was swimming in that when I was eight years old in 1966, if you can believe that. There's a sport fishing pier we've uh, allocated monies to replace. Where yet, we're not sure. There's our full pier in the distance. There's the mouth of the harbor. We have a beautiful harbor, direct access to the ocean, very close. There's our new class one bike path, award winning, I might add. There's a sea lab on the right, trying to find a place for them. And that's our big opportunity. So uh, here we are. Sorry we didn't have any sound. <coughs> Most of you have seen it anyway, so. Anyway, with that, we're gonna have a, a, a panel discussion here. They're gonna give some presentations. We're very, very fortunate for them to come and spend their valuable time with us. A lot of people are excited about it, but you know, few people are willing to just show up and take time out of their busy schedules to, to come and help us. So, um, first up is gonna be Richard Wilson. He's with Smith Gordon Architects in Chicago. Richard leads the city design practice of Adrian Smith and Gordon Gill Architecture in Chicago. Richard's an architect and city planner with more than three decades of experience working with public and private sector clients around the world to envision, design, build dynamic regions, cities, urban districts, and neighborhoods. His work fo focuses on large-scale urban development and redevelopment in historic and emergent cities worldwide. Richard was involved with the master planning for Chicago's Millennium Park, the Chicago Riverwalk, and 760 acres along the north branch of the Chicago River where land is transitioning from industrial to mixed use. His global practice includes award-winning work throughout North America, China, India, and the Middle East, including three National Union Design Awards, or excuse me, National Urban Design Awards from the American Institute of Architects. Richard serves on the board of directors for the National Parks Conservation Association and Friends of the Chicago River. Richard is currently leading master planning for the 2020 World's Fair in Dubai and advocating for new riverfront parkland in Chicago. Let's welcome Richard Wilson. Get the clicker. All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation, and I'm so proud to meet your mayor uh, and to learn of this tremendous opportunity, and we recognize these are the kind of major projects that unfold, you know, in many chapters uh, over the life of a, of a city, uh, and so I was just so intrigued when we got to spend time in Alaska and learn about this 50 acres on the coast, uh, and, uh, and, you know, it's really unique, and I see this in my work across uh, the United States. So many communities have these old industrial plants or old pieces of infrastructure or industrial areas that have kind of lost their day and you're so fortunate that you actually get kind of the second bite of the apple. And, uh, and I was just blown away, unlike where I'm from in Chicago, that you actually have an active say and a vote uh, in what happens in your city. Uh, so I don't come tonight, that's right. So I, I want to be clear, I don't come tonight with a design proposal. I'm not selling anything. This is really a sister-to-sister -sister kind of collaboration and discussion. Uh, for 20 years, I've been working in the city of Chicago, both uh, with the city and at the neighborhood and citizen level. Uh, so really want to kind of share some of the stories, some of the lessons we've learned, show you how we've gone about projects, not that it's the perfect fit here. Uh, but hopefully there'll be bits and pieces here that you can take away so that you can start to have a conversation amongst yourselves with the mayor, uh, and with your partners uh, as the land is purchased and moves forward in development uh, so that you could imagine your home in the next chapter in your future. 
So if I just introduce my firm for a moment, we're probably best known for uh, pretty uh, tall buildings, including the world's largest, uh, build, tallest building in Dubai. We have the world's next tallest building under construction in Jeddah. So if your community process leads you to decide that you need the world's next tallest building <laughs> in Redondo Beach, California, uh, at that point, we'd be glad to come back uh, and have a chat. Uh, but in addition to that, you know, buildings have to fit in a place, so uh, I lead what's called the city design practice, and it's really working at the community level to understand the quality of life uh, that we're able to offer through our parks, our open spaces, the programs that we have, places for that, and uh, work takes me all over the world. Uh, but I tell you, I'm just so passionate about work that you get to do uh, in your home. It means the most at the end of the day. So I want to show you a little bit uh, about Chicago. Uh, and so I thought I would start out with what we call our central area. It's really our downtown, but it's 12 large neighborhoods that all come together. And it's really the empl Ah, uh, all right. Okay. All right, very good. Question is, could we dim the lights just a bit, please? Well done. Well done. Excellent. That a little better? All right, good. Uh, so, um, you know, we've been working uh, to identify some of these sites, like you have the power plant here. We have old industrial rail corridors. We have old power plant sites that are there. Uh, and really looking to where areas that we have to grow. So the blue that you see here are opportunity sites where we started to kind of think ahead about what kinds of development policy we need, what we would need of our development partners that would purchase property, uh, how we would service it with all modes of transportation, and really focusing on the parks and open space uh, that make the city uh, vibrant. We've really ranted, ranted around how we're going to grow our employment core, um, complete our lakefront park system. The huge story emerging from Chicago today is how the river is really reintroducing this next phase of growth in our life. Uh, and really, our kind of, this all kind of started with something we didn't understand the magnitude of when we started to have conversations about it and actually got it built, uh, was the impact of Millennium Park. So I'll say, uh, talk about that in pretty uh, good detail. So again, we kind of grew and started out along the lakefront. We've been growing uh, further to the west near our regional transportation system, trying to understand what that next generation of rail is, but also recognizing that people love to bike and to walk, and we need to provide park spaces and connectivity so that people have the opportunity to do that. And we're pursuing kind of these mega uh, projects, you know, that would take a lifetime to deliver new high-speed rail service that links, and those are very important. But at the same time, really trying to look at the streets and the places we have and redesign them so they perform better. So I was so proud to see your, your, your uh, track, bike track that's there. I spent some time on it today. Really fantastic job with that uh, so we could learn from you. Um, you know, we don't have the, uh, the ocean where we are, but we do have a spectacular lakefront. Uh, and a beautiful park system, yet we still have places where we have some missing teeth. So when I go along your area in this beautiful community and I see the power plant, I think, oh, you know, there's something that, that you have the opportunity to work on. So a few years we've been working on how we could actually expand and develop more uh, parkland. Uh, and so today what we're doing is looking at the redesign of Lakeshore Drive, the main uh, highway that goes uh, along the lakefront there. Uh, and trying to imagine how we can smooth out some high accident points, how we can actually guard against the lake blowing into the roadway during our blizzard and winter season, and actually creating more parkland uh, in the city. Uh, the river, again, is kind of our big story. So Chicago, we grew up with a beautiful lakefront, kind of envy of the world, except California here on the beautiful ocean. Uh, we developed large parks is how we grew as a city, and we would develop neighborhoods around those. But what we never had was a very strong vision for the role of the river uh, as, as uh, contributing to quality of life because it was always a working industrial river. So as now we move into the 21st century, we're having great conversation and opportunity in front of us to think of how the river uh, can connect neighborhoods uh, and improve quality of life. So this is a, a project that started working on in 2009. It's the uh, Chicago River Walk, and we've completed the area in, the main, in downtown. It's the red line uh, there called the uh, Main Branch. 
Uh, and we wanted to uh, bring people down to the river. Uh, we used to not to be able to walk along the edge. We'd have to climb up and around each one of these bridges. So we've actually uh, valued parkland. We've built underbridge connections, uh, created three miles of continuous walkway there, uh, and created a place that's truly active uh, day and night. Uh, so this was kind of the vision and early planning with the community, and uh, we knew that we wanted to kind of treat each room uh, to have its own identity and its own kind of activity. We would have places that were more uh, active, uh, where you could actually bring boats up in the daytime. We have children's play areas. We have swim and splash areas. But as I was going through this, when we wrapped up, they would say, oh, Richard, this is beautiful. We would love to do this, but you're crazy. This will never happen. This is a hundred million dollars. Where on earth will this ever come through or come from? We, we just can't do it. 2009, mind you, uh, and within uh, eight years, nine years, we had actually banded together, figured it out, got the thing built, uh, and now it's driving the next generation of growth uh, in our city. So I just look at this 50 acre site that you have here, and if you get this right, and I know you will, uh, the benefit to this community, anything that you invest in this will come back to you uh, tenfold. Uh, in terms of what this is doing for us, uh, this new river walk, so today we have many new buildings that are approved or under construction uh, in the middle of the city, uh, adjacent to the river. Uh, as we go south along our river, we're cleaning up old industrial sites, we've completed rezoning, we have development that's coming in here uh, that's just been announced for a major um, uh, new uh, tech uh, businesses. Uh, and then as we move along the north branch of the river, again, an old industrial area that we're trying to clean up. Uh, and so this is the, uh, the north uh, branch area of our city today. All the low buildings are in old industrial areas, old rail lines, old power plants, old barge shipping areas that frankly, you know, their useful life has passed. So we've just changed the development regulations. We're enabling major new density. We're linking with new transportation systems that are here. And now the developers are coming forward. So we actually have five 50 acre sites uh, that have just been purchased. Uh, now here comes the rush of developers. They're beating down the door. They're telling us they need a billion dollars of public investment in infrastructure in order for them to make a hundred billion dollars of profit. Uh, and so we're in the throes of that. So we're seeing a lot of pretty pictures like this. You know, I'm really nervous because all I see when I look at this is all the concrete along the river. So we have four miles of new concrete to build along the river. That doesn't seem right. So, you know, the first 20 years of my career has been with the city of Chicago, and, and, and it's a labor of love. It's kind of interesting now because I've fallen on the side of the community where we think we can do better. So we've been working and banded together a civic alliance of major uh, design, nature advocacy, uh, sports, neighborhood, and business groups. Uh, we formed a, a friends coalition. Uh, and so this is what the developer has in mind. And uh, although we're very excited about development potential, this is what we're advocating for. It's that we can have both because as a city, we will never be more leveraged than we are the day that these major parcels have been purchased and the day they come forward to seek development approval. And this is not anti-development whatsoever. First and foremost, this is an economic development issue. You know, uh, access to parks and open space is a key to attracting top talent and retaining it to building active and healthy communities. Uh, it's a transportation improvement because you make places where people want to bike and walk and can go up the river to interconnect places. Uh, and it's well documented, a minimum of 15% increase in adjacent or in property value for those that own the property. It's an increase in tax value for the municipality. Uh, it's an increase for anybody that has property where they're trying to, you know, uh, broker property because the people go into leases much quicker along the river. So in the end, uh, you know, you can have both and uh, and the value, uh, and it's really is is uh, is key. And it's really thinking about intergenerational benefits. So not just do the quick thing, make the deal, get it done. It's really thinking about the legacy of the city, our heritage, how we've grown. Uh, and doing our part as stewards of our community when we're about to see such major change. So when I met Bill in Alaska and I saw this, and then today, you know, being here and really looking at the site, and tonight, 
looking at this uh, great uh, crowd here, very interested. Um, I'm just uh, very excited about the potential that you have in front of you to do uh, amazing things. So we banded together, we kind of pushed back, we've created some images here to show how we could have both. We're talking about how we could have natural restored wetlands along the water area, how we could bring people into an area of the city where they've never been since we were founded. So more than 150 uh, years to enjoy uh, nature in the center uh, of the city. All right. So, um, you know, I wanted to spend, I'll just kind of wrap up on this, spend a little bit more about Millennium Park. And uh, hopefully uh, you've seen Millennium Park or some had visited here. Uh, and I tell you, this was a long, hard-fought battle. We didn't know what we were getting into when we started this. Uh, but I know for sure we could never have envisioned the uh, tremendous amount of benefit it's delivered back to us tenfold. Uh, so this is Millennium Park. It was a 24-acre uh, parking lot and rail yard in the middle of the city. It's old Illinois Central Railroad that came right through uh, the city and still runs there today. Uh, beautiful. Uh, looks familiar. Uh, and so, you know, we thought we could do better. So we're within uh, Grant Park, kind of an old turn-of-the-century park system that had a series of rooms. So we really wanted to complete uh, this last part of the city, uh, or of the park system uh, in the downtown. Uh, so what this is, it's uh, actually still an active rail bus line. It has levels of parking there. It has a park that's actually a big green roof cap. And a lot of the parking that's under there is actually part of our economic strategy to actually pay and maintain uh, the park uh, above. All right. So here's the master plan. So, you know, a lot of community process to talk about what kinds of things we would like. So, you know, the parks I just showed you on the river were about active recreation. And I've seen some past work envisioning here. And, it, you know, so that could be a component of it. Um, we don't have any natural wetlands area. Like I said, it's an elevated area. Uh, but just imagine what you could do thinking about the old Salt Lake as a central point in there. Uh, and, and, you know, it's amazing. If you give nature half a chance, it's amazing how it will come back and, and take over and enrich an, uh, a community. Uh, and then I thought this would be uh, helpful just to kind of get it in our minds, a uh, scale comparison. And this one kind of surprised me. So you'll recognize this. This is uh, Redondo Beach, and that's the power plant site that's there. So if you lay in Millennium Park into the corner, just to get a sense of size, I'm not saying tear it down the old buildings you might want to reuse and all of that, but literally just to compare size, uh, you see it's about half of the land, 24 acres. Or in other words, it's six large city blocks devoted to parkland. And then you see all the development land you have around that. You know, so I just have to dream a little bit when I see those old pictures of the Salt Lake. If I kind of imagine the community before a lot of folks lived here in the Indians, how that was probably, you know, kind of a focal and congregation point. You know, I wonder if there are wonderful ways that you could work with that, with that idea. Uh, you could take components of a park and spread that around. Um, but, you know, you still have other land, so I think you have to have a real discussion about what kind of development is right and fits here and find that balance so that you can actually pay and deliver uh, for all the community benefits that you seek uh, and that you create a structure where you can provide operating and maintenance uh, uh, capital for ongoing um, uh, operations. So we did ours through, uh, created a variety of new landmarks and I'll just kind of walk through these. So we started out, we were just going to do a park, we we're going to get it built in three years. We started out just thinking it was going to be kind of grass and simple. Uh, but then along the way, people started to get excited about it. Our corporate partners, philanthropist partners, uh, families in the community uh, actually started to kind of layer on to that and wanted to be a part of it. So we had a contribution here, uh, Pritzker Bandshell, Frank Gehry uh, structure, we have all kinds of community events as well as major uh, kind of uh, symphony and dance events, uh, a great lawn here. It's very important to us that we have an area where you can buy seats and sit there and watch that, but we also have an area for 11,000 people that is always free and clear to the public. You can come enjoy any show that's there. It's not closed off to ticket holders owner only, uh, so it's always a public space. Should probably find a more flattering picture, uh, <laughs> uh, but it's actually used for community health and yoga uh, on the weekends, every Saturday and Sunday morning. It's really uh, a lot of fun. 
Uh, and then, you know, not to get too technical here, but another thing that was really smart, I thought, was that we had uh, three or four small performance groups, dance, ballet, opera, that alone had been trying to raise money to build their own facility and couldn't, you know, couldn't quite pull that off. Uh, so what we were able to do is actually uh, pool their resources, develop an indoor theater that shares the back of house with the big band shell that I just showed you there. And in this way, we were able to help many organizations move forward uh, in a coordinated manner uh, and be part of the park.